this all just right, everything, and I had to turn the fan on. Okay. If you all wonder what I do when I kneel behind the pulpit, it's, there's a fan under here, so the French fry lights, you know, they just get kind of warm up here sometime in the summertime. Turn with me, if you will, this morning to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we'll be looking at verses 23 and 34 together in just a little bit. This morning we're going to have the Lord's Supper, communion, uh, together, and it is a special time, and I know sometimes we go through different things in the church uh, life, and we don't take time to explain. Some of you out there this morning may have the question, why, why do we do communion? Why, why do we have this time when we get this little bitty wafer that don't have any taste to it, and we take this little cup of juice, why, why do we do that? And so this morning I thought I'd take an opportunity uh, to share that with us on this very special day. Because ever since early Christians met secretly in their homes to remember the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, the church, that's us, has been celebrating communion service. They met together and they break bread. Uh, that means they shared in communion. So all of us here this morning know generally what communion is all about. And I think far too often though this community, this church body, we, we do things and we don't pause enough. And I, I never want it to be commonplace. Uh, communion celebration is to be looked upon uh, as a celebration of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it means several things that I want to share. You see, because uh, some people do it every Sunday. There are some churches that do it every Sunday. My fear is that it becomes a ritual. You know what a ritual is? A ritual is something that we do and we lose the meaning of it. It has no meaning to us. And I never want the Lord's Supper to be that with us today. I mean, I know as Baptists, we usually do it at least once a quarter. Uh, we can do it less, we can do it more. But no matter when we come together, I want it to be a special time. And so as, as we do this, we prepare ourselves and our hearts and we examine ourselves. Because that's what the Word of God tells us that we ought to do. I, I want us to look at several points here this morning on what exactly communion is to us as believers. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 23. This is Paul writing to the church at Corinth. He says, For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take heed, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, he also took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. You see, all the things that God did, or the Lord Jesus did that night, was a part of a Passover. You all know the Passover story. It's, it's when uh, one of the plagues came about the last one uh, where uh, Moses was trying to get the Pharaoh to understand what God was trying to say. And that was simply to let his people go, to release them from bondage. And yet, we know that Pharaoh, after each one of the preceding nine plagues, was still hardened in his heart. And so finally God said that finally, uh, if there is not blood on the doorpost and the mantle of your homes, then uh, the firstborn of that household will die. And of course, then when the death angel came, and they took blood that most of the Jewish people did and, and put it on their doors, uh, the death angel passed over and all that in the home was safe. Well, it was this Passover meal that proclaimed really salvation. That's what Passover is all about. Is that we all here this morning deserve to die. For the wages of sin is death. Amen. Every one of us deserve to die. But it is through the grace of God, the blood, 
that God passes over, <laughs> that God gives us grace. Now, the, the key in both circumstances is the blood has to be applied. It wasn't enough to say, well, I know where the blood is, and I, I, I know what I should do, but I, I, I don't have time to do it right now. I, I'm going to do it when I get a chance. I know Moses said that's a way to save the firstborn of my family, I, but I had this to do, and I got this to do, and, and, and I'm going to get to it. But my friend, let me tell you something. It didn't matter all the good intentions that you had. When that death angel passed through that night, through the land of Egypt, your firstborn was going to die if the blood was not applied. Well, here I'm to tell you in 2019, this August the 25th, is that God has given you the blood. He's given you the understanding. He's told you in His Word what is necessary to receive the grace of God. And you, and only you, must apply the blood. In other words, you must ask forgiveness. You must repent of your sins. And Jesus Christ, through His shed blood on Calvary, will be applied to your life, and you will not die. Now, don't get amazed. You all understand that. I'm talking about eternal life. Yes, this body's going to give up one of these days. It's going to die. But after that, it's glory. And that's what God has promised us. And friend, when we take communion, it is that that we think about most of all. Because it is only through Jesus Christ. So let me get into my points here this morning. That was just all introduction. Number one, it is a time of commemoration. These verses remind us and it says that it is a time of calling to mind. In other words, we're to think about the great sacrifice. We're to think about the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we gather at the Lord's table, our mind ought to be focused on this. We're not offering a new sacrifice. We're remembering the one that Jesus Christ gave us. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 10 says, For God will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for our idea, or once and for all. And so we have an opportunity this morning to reflect on what Jesus did for us. I think communion is a wonderful time to think about if you can remember the day you got saved. You know, the process that God went through. I mean, to me, it was several events on that April the 12th. That, that God brought me through. There were some things in my life that was going on that made me very much aware that, that I needed Jesus, that I needed Him, that I needed His forgiveness. I need, and listen, it was a series of events that brought me that day to where I was sitting in a pew as a young man, and I knew that when the preacher gave the altar call, that I needed to get myself out of there, get to the altars, and begin to ask God to forgive me of my sins. And guess what he did? And I never will forget that day. So it is a time that, that we remember, we reflect upon those things. Secondly, it's a time of contemplation. Not only are we to remember what Jesus has done for us and for all humanity, but we're to contemplate his great sacrifice to us as individuals. What does it mean to, me, mean to you? Let me ask this question. As we examine ourselves, as we contemplate what Jesus Christ did, have you been saved? Do you know that you're saved? John said in the conclusion of his gospel that these things were written, the Bible in other words, the New Testament, these things were written that you might know that you have eternal life. Church, it's possible this morning to know that you have eternal life. You don't have to go to bed tonight wondering whether or not that you're saved or not. The Bible says that we know. Does Jesus Christ sacrifice? When you take communion, does it move your heart? Does it mean something special? When we announce that you're going to have communion, is it an event in your spiritual walk with the Lord that, that has significance? I hope so. Does the fact that you're going to live forever ever pass through your mind? You know, I, you know. sometimes I think when we're young, 
We don't think about eternity a whole lot. But let me tell you, once you pass 60, you start thinking about it more and more. Amen? Amen. How about some of you that passed 70? Do you think about it a little bit more than you did? How, how about 80? Oh, Brother Noble, you passed 90. So, so you think about it, don't you? you your thoughts begin to, to think about it. Brother Noble's 93 years young. Amen? Amen. And, and, and he, he is to be in me. And, and so, church, do we, when we take communion this morning, do we reflect, do we contemplate what Jesus Christ did for us? Number three, it's a time of identification. You see, I say that because when we take communion, it is one of those publicly testifying times. In other words, when I take communion, I'm telling you that Jesus lives inside of me. And when I take the, the bread where it presents his body, that means something. That body that bore the stripes, that body that hung on the cross, that body that was sacrificed because I couldn't pay the price for my sins. When I take that, that means something to me. I reflect upon that. I identify with that. And then when I take the juice that represents the blood of Christ, I think about the Passover. I think about when God looks at me, and I know the dirty side of me, but I also know that the blood cleanses me. It makes me as white as snow. It makes me able to enter into the very presence of God because I'm covered with the blood of Jesus Christ. I identify with that. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9 through 11, says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and shalt believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You say, Pastor, it's got to be harder than that. No, it isn't. That's God's part. That's God's part. He, he did that for you. He died for you. You just have to receive it like a gift. Now, the hard part comes is living like it. Living like you're saved. Living your life in order to give glory and honor to what Jesus Christ did. Now the world may call us fools. They may say that we use the Lord as some kind of deity crutch. Well, I'm a, I've heard that on several uh, groups, things that I listen or read about. You know, oh, you guys created God because humanity has this necessity to have somebody greater than him. No, I'm not. I accept Jesus Christ. Because he is the Son of God. Because I, I believe he is. And I identify with what he did. And I've identified by confessing with my mouth. I testify to this world that Jesus is alive. Hopefully, hopefully by the way I live, by the way I talk. The fourth thing is, it's a time of declaration. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. Uh, Paul writes again for us, often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. So see, communion is a declaration. When, when Jesus said, remember, he's saying it's a declaration that each and every one of us says that I recognize the fact that there's a promise attached to the bread, to the juice, that when Jesus not only talked about the Passover uh, feast there with the disciples, he was proclaiming that this New Testament is an eternal proclamation that each and every one of us can have that through Jesus we'll have eternal life. Now, now church, he's coming again. Matter of fact, uh, we're going to get back into our end of days prophecy messages on Sunday morning. I've just taken a couple of breaks here just to kind of give to us because uh, again, I know when we start studying a lot of this stuff, we're going to be getting into the vials. We're going to be getting into the seals. Uh, we're going we're, we're to be looking at these events that are going to unfold here real soon. And I know sometimes it can just, your brain can get all full, all right? And I don't want that to happen. I want you to be able to absorb these things. But what Jesus is saying here by virtue of communion when you do these things, you proclaim to others around you. See, it's a testimony. You all know what a testimony is. It's a legal terminology. 
You can't testify to something you haven't experienced or you haven't seen. All right? That's invalid, you know? But when you testify, you say, I saw that. Or you can testify saying, yeah, I've experienced that because I, it's happened to me. Well, when we do communion, we proclaim to this lost and dying world. We, we proclaim to many a visitor that's come in our sanctuary that doesn't know Jesus. You're proclaiming, you're testifying of what Jesus did. John, in his Gospel, chapter 14, verse 6, said, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father but through me. Folks, there's only one way. Communion tells us that there is only one Lord Jesus Christ. There is only one. I know there's a mentality in the world today that says all roads will eventually lead us to God. You can be a Buddhist, you can be a Hindu, you can be a Muslim, you can be this, you can be that, but ultimately all these ways are going to end up before God. Well, there is truth in that statement because my Bible says we'll all stand before Him one day and give an account. So yes, they're all right. All roads lead to God, but there's going to be a big difference there because one, you're going to stand there by yourself with all your false religions, with all your false ideologies, with all your false ideas, folks, and you'll stand before him. You know what? God's going to say, well, what did you do with my son? Did you accept him? Did you believe in him? Is he your Lord? Because if he's not, and that evidence will be found in a book, the Lamb's Book of Life. And when God calls for the reading, and he says, as John Doe's, name in the book. And I believe that angel will look and he'll say, Father, it's not there. God will say, depart from me, for I know you not. But oh, for all of us believers, huh, that's accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. When God the Father turns and he says, his heart ciphers, huh, his R.J. driver's name, uh, it, it is Joe Howard's name. Uh, it is Alan Carter's name. It is it in the book. You know when that angel says, yes, it's in the book. Guess what? Then the Father will turn to us and he'll say, enter in, thou faithful servant. Come on in and enjoy the mansion that my son has prepared for you. Oh, I'll yeah, tell you what, folks. What a day of rejoicing that's going to be. Amen? Amen. I'm not going to sing that this morning. Number five. It's a time of expectation. We are also reminded that at this time serves to stir up the thoughts and concerning of the return of Christ. All right? That, that's why we preach it. That's why we believe it. I believe with all my heart that Jesus Christ is coming again. Do you? Do you believe he's coming back? Do you believe he's coming back for you? Amen. Amen? Are you ready to go? Amen. And glory, can he come back right now? Amen. Yes, amen. We've all got our driver's license, right? Amen. amen. Remember I told you I prayed. I did. I prayed, said, Lord, don't come back until I get my driver's license. <laughs> when I was young then, I thought, oh, man. Lord, don't let me come back. Don't come back. I want to get my Listen, Lord, I, I want to. I want to drive, you know, I thought that was the biggest thing until I come to the realization that I not only can drive when I go to glory, but I'll be able to fly and we don't need to go over that again. So there in heaven, Jesus makes intercession for us at the throne of God. That's, that's so beautiful. But never let us forget when we participate in communion this morning, we remember that he has promised to return for us. Now John, chapter 14, verse 1 and 3, a familiar passage of Scripture. Let me read it to you this morning. It says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, that's where I want to be, folks, wherever he is, okay, that where I am, there you will be. I will be. Put your name in there. Will be also. 
So as we do, the Lord's Supper reminds us of the fact that He is coming again. Matthew chapter 24, verse 44 says this, Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. He's coming, church. And then finally, finally, and I believe very importantly, it's a time of examination. Now note verses 27 through 31 in 1 Corinthians. Because Paul gives the church, you and me, a stern warning. He says, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord, unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily Eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Verse 30, For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Now I've told you before, that doesn't mean you're taking a nap, that means you're dead. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. So when we take communion, my brothers and sisters, it is a time to examine ourselves so that we, we are not doing it unworthily. And, and very simply, it just simply means that we are confessing sin. I know sometimes as Christians it's easy to justify our lifestyle, but I don't think there's any justification of anything when it comes to standing before God, especially during time of communion, especially when Paul gives us such a strong and stern warning about this. So now, this examination can be several things. Let me just quickly give you three. First of all, this warning is given to the lost. Number one, it's given to the lost. No one who has not been saved should take the Lord's Supper. Now, I say that as a warning. I say that to each and every one of you here if you're not saved, don't do it. it. It's not necessary. Because this is just not some, again, ritual that we go through in the church. You need to be saved. You need to be able to identify. You need to be able to commemorate. You need to be able to go through the things that I've shared with you, but especially it's a time of examination. N number two, it is a warning to the backslider. It's a warning to the backslider. When we come to the Lord's table with sin in our lives, we're, we're opening ourselves up to God's judgment. Do you, do you understand that? Because the Bible says He'll chasten those. In other words, God's not going to let you live a lie. As a matter of fact, Paul says in verse 32, but, but when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned in the world. So, so listen, God loves you. And he's not going to let you do things that are unworthy. Because he's going to get your attention one way or another. That's why I think Paul said that many are sickly among you. Many are weak. You know, church, we, 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 we somehow think that we're immune from God's judgment because we're a child of God. Well, let me tell you something. God loves you. And the Bible says that God chastens those he loves. You know what chastening means, don't you? It's another word for a whooping. Huh? Now that can take on many different forms. But that means God is going to get your attention. And so, listen, if you, I, I, don't want, I don't want the chastening of God. And, and all of us are mature enough to understand that. We're also mature enough to not go where we don't need to go, think about what we don't need to think, and see what we don't need to see. All right, we're all big boys and big girls. And so we need to live our life accordingly. And then number three, it's a warning against taking communion lightly. Too often I think people come to the Lord's table and when we send out the cry or we read the passage that we're to examine ourselves, uh, I think sometimes people don't do it. And so folks, there's a lot of things that can come in our heart 
bitterness, hatred, anger, unfaithfulness. All those things are important that we take care of. And that's why Paul said that we, we need to examine ourselves. And in, in, in church, listen, we, there's no r rituals like in some... You know, it amazes me how some people can follow other associations, you might want to say, and, and, and they discipline their members, and they go through different harsh rituals. And Listen, it, it's, it's probably harder to, to serve in some of these organizations and groups out there than it is to be a Christian. Because God didn't want it to be a bunch of rules and regulations. God wanted you to serve Him because you love Him. That, that's the one requirement that God puts before each and every one of us to serve Him. And that is the love. <laughs> and so, as we prepare ourselves, and I, I call the deacons now to prepare to come to service. So if the deacons will come and, and set our table up before us, let me close with these few thoughts. As a child, many of us can remember our mothers telling us to wash up for dinner. You remember, you know, we've been out playing in the dirt, in the garbage. Gentlemen, just go ahead and come on. I, I just got so many, so many words I got to get out. Um, and mom would say, wash up. You know, don't come to the table with a dirty face or dirty hands. And that's what the Lord is telling us this morning. If, if you want to receive communion, and I've told you this many times before, any believer that is in the house, I don't care what denomination, I don't I listen, whether you're a member or not of Norris Baptist Church, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are welcome to take communion. That's what it's for. To remember, to celebrate what Jesus did for us. But let me give to you some thoughts as we prepare your heart this morning. Number one again, are you saved? It's really important before you receive it that you're saved. If you're not saved this morning, you can be. The Bible says, I read it to you, that if you'll confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Lord Jesus it, it is God's Son and the Bible says you'll be saved. It's not hard. It's not hard because Jesus Christ loved you and He died for you. Are you saved? Number two, here's the big one. Is your life pleasing to the Lord? Is it? As you examine your heart this morning, is it pleasing to the Lord? Are there hidden things in your life that need to be dealt with the Lord? Is there any problems? Folks, right now, as I'm speaking to you, you can go through the process. You can say, Father, yes. Lord, there's some things that I know that the Spirit has been putting His finger on. He's been pointing them out to me. And Lord, I've just kind of been pushing Him aside. But Lord, I, I, before I take communion, I, I want to be right. I want you and I to be good. And so Lord, I confess those things. And I repent of those things. See, so remember the difference between repentance and, and uh, confession is confession is admitting that you're wrong. Repenting is not doing them again. Big difference. You know, we confess when we get caught. Yeah, I did that. Repenting means in your heart saying, I'm not going to do it again. So are you confessing or repenting? You need to confess and repent. You need to admit that you've done it. Then you need to say, Lord, I won't do it again. Forgive me. If you'll do those things, my brother and sister, then you can accept communion today with an open heart. And I want you to do that. So let me pray for you. And then let's prepare our hearts as we do. Heavenly Father, we come to this time of the service, Lord. And 
we want to reflect upon you. We want to reflect upon what Jesus Christ did for us. And God, as, as Paul instructs the church at Corinth, as, as he does us, Father, we want to examine ourselves. And if there, if there be anything in us, Lord, any sin, any, anything that is hindering uh, our blessing from you, O oh God, today, I pray, Lord, that we will just seek your forgiveness, and that, Lord, we'll seek to never do it again, that we will confess our lives before you, Lord, and that we'll live a holy life. Forgive us, Lord. In Jesus' name, I pray. Let's prepare to receive communion this morning. Brother Steve, after we have communion, we'll sing our hymn of invitation. Please hold these elements till everyone is served and then we'll partake of the bread and the juice together. thank those that prepare our communion for us every communion Sunday for their devotion and love. They pour the juice of the cups and they put the wafers in there for us. And I want to thank you, Brother Wendell's team that always helps him. Okay, at this time our men are here to serve you.
Once again, the Apostle Paul wrote, For I have received of the Lord that which I also deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, Take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. Do you believe he's coming again? I do too. Let's partake of the wafer together. And let's take of the juice. Precious Lord and Savior, we love you this morning. And Lord, we reflect upon your great sacrifice. We thank you for saving us. We thank you for dying on that Calvary's cross for our sin. Now, Lord, we look forward to seeing you again, to being in your presence, to living eternally with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, bless your people here today. Be with them, I pray. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Stand, if you will, please. Let's sing our hymn of invitation. If there is any need that you have, we'd be glad to pray for that need. And I invite you, if you need to get saved, I invite you, my friend, to come here this morning at these altars and receive God's wonderful forgiveness. Amen. Brother Steve.